Today we're, we're talking about a message called, uh, titled Immorality. So I want to warn, if anyone's got smaller children, you're concerned. I, I don't go into much graphic at all, but I do use the three-letter word also with uality put to it. So if you need to have your child go to uh, the children's church, it's K to, K to fifth. There's two different ones, and you might need to do that. But I don't think anybody is going to feel offended here. It just so happens this kind of comes up. We, I felt led to, that the pastors to go work together to preach through the book of Corinthians. And yet our young people have been in a series, too, about purity, uh, moral purity, uh, and have even did a parenting, a grandparenting uh, yesterday a seminar on yesterday uh, with, uh, uh, what was it called? It was called uh, technology or something like that, uh, staying pure with the technology or being aware of all the technology. What was it called? Smart Parenting, parenting in a Digital World. I couldn't remember that. So, uh, which is, was really good, I heard. And there's a lot of people that came and I feel like there were a lot of people that couldn't be there on all the graduations and so forth. So we'll hopefully offer that again and uh, maybe others can come. My, my daughter had her uh, wedding shower yesterday, and so I was tied up watching three grandkids for five and a half hours, <laughs> of which uh, Elizabeth, uh, Sam is homesick, and, and Elizabeth, Sam, uh, I just tell you, I love th those kids of yours, but you are a hero putting up with uh, a one-year-old, a, uh, a two-year-old, and a four-year-old. I don't know how you do it full time. It's worse than three full time jobs. Uh, so, good job. <clears throat> Those of you that are laughing, if you've ever, uh, well, just forget it. So, we, we've been looking into Corinthians, and one of the things we look at is people follow people. That was a problem then, it's a problem now. That's why people follow people, personalities on radio and TV, and they hear some crazy nut stuff. I know of some local churches where crazy nut stuff is being taught, not biblical. It's weird, wacky, way out there, crazy theology and practice of religion because people follow man. And then the argument was, you say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm of Cephas or Peter, whatever. And we have that. And last week, our, our speaker, just the, the thing that really I took from it was that people, people, uh, Sometimes their preferences get in the way of seeing Jesus, and we're here about Jesus. So you may prefer a better-looking, younger preacher with hair or an older, better-looking preacher with hair, but you got me. No, don't even go there. No, that's not why I said it. Stop. The, the punchline is this. The punchline is this. It's not about me. I don't want it to be about me. It's about Jesus. Because when it's about me then you can get easily offended. When it's about me, I'm human and I make mistakes and you can miss Jesus because of me, right? So when you come to church, try to get focused on Jesus throughout the week, try to get focused on Jesus because people are so discouraging, even preachers. We're discouraging as can be because we are creatures. And, you know, and, and I, I do my best to walk closely with God and I believe there's a level that most of you and, and many people that really love the Lord have not reached that's so capable of reaching. I keep coming back to Jesus every time it heals someone, say, go and sin no more. You know, there, there is not this thing of where you go, oh, well, Jesus died for me. We're universally saved. Everybody's saved. It doesn't matter what you do. That is just not even right. And, uh, and so, so it does matter. Jesus, Jesus was clear in his teachings. And so his brother James was clear in his teachings. You can talk about faith, you can talk about grace, you can talk to your blue in the face. But unless you follow Jesus with your deeds and actions, then you're all just talk. We can be hypocrites in many different ways. And we've all fallen, that doesn't mean you're a hypocrite, but when you live a lifestyle of constant hypocrisy, that's when Jesus would say, that's the hypocritical. So don't think I'm calling you hypocrite because you've ever made a mistake or you've fallen down or you've done some stupid things or you've done immoral things, right? So at the close of the service, in the early service, I got to thinking about this. I should have asked this at the beginning of service, not the close of the service. How many of you know that whether you've thought things, as Jesus said, if you think things in your heart and in your mind and you, even if you don't do them and you, you would if you could, you know, that when he says don't commit adultery, but you think it, that you do that, how many of you, whether it's through thoughts or actions at some point in your life, have 
uh, have asked, had to ask God to forgive you of something immoral. Raise your hand high. You've had to ask God to forgive you of something immoral. All right, so, and I'll tell you, if you've never had a thought and you didn't raise your hand, then you are, I, I would love to, that's good. I'm, <laughs> I'm so proud of you. There's probably people that are that way. Uh, but more, immorality is a huge problem in our culture. And I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to focus on the negativity because the answer to it is a changed heart. The answer to any sin is a heart change because Jeremiah said, your heart is wicked. Who can, who can even know it? Only God can change your heart. When Christ saves you, he doesn't save you in your sin. He saves you from your sin. The angel told Joseph, call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin. He didn't save you so you could wallow in sin. Romans 6 says, shall we go on sinning cause grace, so that grace can abound? He says, God forbid. That is never the point. He says, he talks about water baptism in Romans 6. It starts right after that. And it says, don't you know, you know, that you, you were buried with him. You died of yourself, the old flesh. You were buried with him in baptism. The old man's put away. The whole, all things become new. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Don't wallow in that. Don't live there. You have the spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead in you. You have the word of God that's more powerful than any two-edged sword. You can be an overcomer, and the overcomers are what God is asking us to do. It's, I'm, not, I, I'm not wanting to make anybody feel like that they're not a child of God if they don't get so much of an overcomer that they don't have any sin in life. That's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about a desire to follow God and to please God and walk with God and be right with God and do things that are right. And sometimes it's a matter of running from the, the, from the, running from the temptation of sin. Like get out of there. Like, like learn where the triggers are. Learn what you need to avoid. Learn to be careful. Stay away from the places that maybe can make you fall. So I could walk into any bar and witness all day long and be there all day long and I'd never be tempted to get drunk. I wouldn't, wouldn't be tempted to, to, to even drink because number one, I can't stand the taste of it. Number two, it's killed a lot of people I love. And it's also broken up a lot of marriages. It's also abused a lot of people with the influence of alcohol. So I hate alcohol, period. I, I mean, my desire, I'm like Solomon. It says when you see the wine in the bottle and it's red and it's bubbly in the glass, just kind of stay away from that because for a lot of people, that's going to bite them in the end. It's going to get them. It may not be you. It may not be your kids. It might be your grandkids. It might be your neighbor. It might be your friend. It's going to bite somebody. And I don't, I, don't, I don't want anything to do. I need to run from things. But some things, for some people, like don't even go there. Don't even get close to it. Like some of you need to like not have a computer. You need to not have access to a computer. That's, that's your victory. Get rid of your computer totally. Get rid of it. If you're at work, you know you're being monitored and you don't have a problem there, that's fine. Otherwise, get rid of your computer. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's not my notes. It's by the Spirit, and I know God wanted me to say that. So let's get to the message because I only have an hour and 10 minutes to preach. <laughs> Immorality, major problem in our culture. So as it was in the, the Corinth, the ancient city, the Greeks, the ancient city of Corinth where the church had been established, there was one church, one group of Christians in Corinth, and Paul writes to them this letter. He'd written some other letters uh, that aren't in the Bible, but just notes, and you see that referred to here. Chapter five, verse one, the first point is dealing with sin in the church. Dealing with sin in the church. Why is that important? Why is it a priority? Why do we need to make sure that we're doing that? Lord, I pray you forgive me and forgive us all, God, for any sort of sin. We just really want to walk close to you to be a shining example of who you are. That there's love beyond measure, full of your spirit, but truth that resides in the middle of that love. We know that you revealed to me, God, I, I, that love without truth is nothing more, the, at very best, humanism. And truth without love is the worst sort of religion you could ever have. And I pray, God, you put truth in the inward parts and fill us with your spirit and power of love. In Christ's name, amen. 1 Corinthians 5, 1. This is an unnamed Christian that was obviously publicly known to be sinning. Notice that the person's name is not mentioned of who he was sleeping with, which was his father's wife, his stepmother. It's not named, and she's not called a believer, and there's nothing about correcting her or bringing her 
to attention here. This is dealing with in the church. So it says this, and it, by the way, the King James says it this way. Uh, I just kind of want to give you, give you the perspective because the word is a little confusing in the King James. It said, it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as name among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And commonly today, that word fornication, which the NIV has it better written, that word fornication would have to do with anything before marriage. That's the, the narrow view of that. But actually, the original word there comes is pornea, sexual immoral. And it says it's actually reported, like, like I can't even believe it, Paul says, actually, really? It's actually reported that there's sexual, sexual immorality among you, is such sexual immorality that's not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. And so this word sexual immoral is pornea, you know where we get some things from there, and it broadly refers to all sexual immorality, everything, everything, from looking at things, whether it's on, in a book or in, in a show or in a movie or a video, looking at things, uh, in your mind, in your um, uh, in behavior before uh, marriage, behavior during marriage that's not right, and behavior after marriage, or uh, in, in whether it's um, heterosexual or homosexual, all, all, all sexual immorality is wrong. And originally, this pornea, the word, the Greek word, it was referred, referring to, before the New Testament times, to mostly just going to a prostitute. But here, it's referring to any kind of, 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 of sexual sin. And so uh, you'll notice that in the list of sins that Paul gives, it's one of the first, first things mentioned when it lists out lots of sins. And uh, it's not because the Christians in Corinth had a hang up about sex. Instead, it's because the, this area was one of the most dramatic differences between the morals of the Greek culture and the culture of the followers of Jesus, where Jesus teaches that there's a, a, a monogamous a woman, a, a relationship between a man and a woman and, and for life, uh, unless there's circumstances of, uh, of, 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 of severe abuse or, or infidelity. And, and so he, he, talks, uh, he talks about that. And, and so, uh, but anyway, uh, it, it, it was not supposed to be among the followers of Jesus. And yet in that culture, it was hugely embraced. But this sin that the Corinthian church just, just didn't even deal with, wasn't dealing with, Paul's upset with them. They're going, what are you doing? Because not even in the Greek culture was this okay. That a father has his, that a man has his father's wife. So, in, and it says have his father's wife. What he's saying there, this wasn't just a moment. This was an ongoing relationship and the people knew about it. It was public and he wasn't repentant. To have refers to ongoing, not just fan, passing fancy or one night stand, it's an ongoing deal. And not even named among the Gentiles, that Paul understood that this kind of incestuous relationship would be considered taboo among even the pagans of the cultures, and yet the Christians in Corinth, at the church of Corinth, they were not, they were just, they were puffed up. You know, they, they didn't bother them one bit. No, no problem there. And so Cicero, you ever heard of Cicero, the ancient, uh, the Roman writer and statesman, he said that this type of incest was an incredible crime and practically unheard of. As, as Paul said, not even named among the Gentiles, meaning they're really immoral, but not even this is there. And Leviticus 18.8 and Deuteronomy 22.30 and Deuteronomy 27.20, specifically names a, 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 a man lying down with his father's wife. It mentions that as it shall not be, it is sin. It mentions it clearly. It actually lists that one thing. One, in Deuteronomy 18, you see several people. You don't sleep with this or this or this. You, it's like listed out very clear. And the culture, this, the Corinthian Christians seem, doesn't seem bothered by it. First, going on to verse 2, you see that the Corinth church, instead of you know, remorsing and feeling grieving, they, they actually were puffed up. It says, and you are puffed up and haven't rather mourned 
that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. You're puffed up and have not rather mourned. As bad as the sin was, Paul was really concerned more with the Christians in Corinth seeming to take the sin lightly and they were unconcerned. They weren't mourning, it didn't bother them. And Paul had been, up at this point, dealing with the mental problems of the, of the, of the Corinth Christians. You know, their pride, their following man, the, uh, the struggle over, you know, who, who God is and so forth that, that really then, uh, about his servants, about the work of God, who really then led to the moral problems. Because if your view about who God is and his authority and he, that he wrote this book and it is a final yes and amen and it, you cannot just pull out the pages you want. If you, if you don't acknowledge who God is in your mentality, then your morality is gonna go down the tubes and that's exactly what's happening in our culture. That's what's going on. And so they were puffed up. They seemed to take it lightly. And Paul had, had uh, uh, his solution to take this notoriously, very well-known, unrepentant man who wasn't just a casual attender in the church, who wasn't just visiting and looking, wasn't just seeking, wasn't just looking to find. No, he's intricate. He's an intricate part. It would be like uh, one of our Sunday school teachers or one of our greeters at the door who are just openly, rebelliously living in sin. Now, let me tell you, there are people that come here and I find out that they live a certain way. I love them and I pick the right point by the Spirit to privately and personally share with them what Scripture has to say about it and encourage them. And then I wait and I'll do it again. Then I'll wait, I'll do it again. At some point, though, I'm going to press as the Spirit leads me, press in such a way that they're going to feel either uncomfortable continuing to come here and think and act like, hey, I'm a great Christian, I'm a follower, so that they are convinced of, of, the, of the, uh, the truth of morality. There is a moral code and a moral standard. The problem with us today is we don't really judge ourselves and judge other believers. We judge the world. That's not okay because they don't know any better. We're to love and speak truth and show them, present Christ, and do our best. But when it comes to looking at ourselves, we need to be honest and we need to repent. We need to not live in, in immorality. Remember the Corinth was a city that was uh, notorious for its immorality. And it wasn't hard to think as a, a, a member of the church in Corinth, or rather a, a citizen of Corinth, the Greeks, it wasn't hard to think that their thought process was in Greek culture, they could matter-of-factly say, mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure, concubines uh, uh, for the daily care of the body, and wives to bear us legitimate children. That was the mindset. It was messed up. And here's why the Corinthians, I believe, weren't dealing with the sin in the church directly and squarely. They were just looking the other way. Why did he say to them, you'd rather you're puffed up, you're proud, why? They were proud for allowing this in the name of tolerance. I'm being tolerant. They were probably saying to themselves, look how loving we are. Look how accepting we are of this brother. Look how open-minded we are. You know, you should never underestimate what people will allow in the name of open-mindedness, of tolerance, of inclusiveness. I believe inclusiveness in many, many ways, but I don't believe that when a person says, I'm a follower of Jesus, and they're a part of your church, and they come, and they're leading, and they're serving, and you just go, it's okay, keep coming. Most pastors won't speak like this because they want to keep attendance and they want to keep money in because attendance means money. But I never tried to build attendance. I don't even know why I have attendance. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not that good a preacher. I'm a terrible administrator. I really don't know what I'm doing. It's true. I'm not just saying that. I really mean that. I don't know. Maybe it's because... I do my best in my clumsy way to say what's true. And I'm trying to say it in as much love as possible. 
look here, uh, they should have been grieving that they were glorying and they should have been dealing with the problem. In 1 Corinthians 5, 3 to 5, here's what Paul says. Look at the next verses. For I indeed as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of Lord Jesus. You can really read a lot of wrong stuff there. And, and, and so he, when he says, I'm absent in body, but present in the spirit, Paul's saying his apostolic authority is there. There's a sense by which the Holy Spirit lives in the body of Christ at large. And that's in tonight, you'll see that chapter 6, 1 Corinthians. Earlier, when it says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that's you as an individual. But together, the Spirit of God resides. We are his body, the church, the Holy Spirit among us. And Paul is simply saying that I'm part of you, and I'm speaking up as a part of you. I'm not only that, but in the chapter, the next chapter, you'll see him talking about, or, the, or just before this in chapter four, he's talking about like being a father, the father of a faith to them, and to care for them, and to watch over them, to teach them, to set an example. He's talking about all of that. And here he's saying, my apostolic authority is present with you. And I'm with you, I'm a part of you, and it's not hard to see from a distance that this thing is wrong. I've already made up my mind, I've already judged the situation. But not too much, he recognizes, notice he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, because it's by the power and authority of Jesus and his words and his teaching. That's what he's saying. And he says, for I indeed have already judged. Matthew 7, 1 to 5 talks about don't judge lest you be judged. And I'm so tired of this in our culture that nobody wants to confront anybody with truth and love and just go, well, who are you to judge? You're not perfect. That's what I hear all the time. Who are you to judge? Well, you're not perfect. Well, it's not, th this is not contradictory at all to Jesus' command. He's, Jesus is talking about hypocritical judgment or talking about judging others by a standard that we're not, not willing to judge ourselves by. Wearsby, Warren Wearsby says this, some judgment is permitted and some is not. While Christians are not to judge another person's motives or ministries within the church, we are certainly expected to be honest about each other's conduct. Otherwise, I can do what I want. Don't you judge me. I'm still your pastor. See, What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If it's good for me, it's good for you. So he says, how could they, how could they, he talks about the, the, the delivering such a one to Satan. What's he saying there? He's saying, don't leave him within the, the, the false security of the church where he thinks everything's okay. No, let him face what he's doing. Like point it out and say, put him under the domain, outside the covering of the church and the blessing of the church where he's under the domain of the world of Satan. So he wallows in his sin and perhaps, just perhaps he'll be saved his spirit because he wakes up to the sinful appetite and lust that has him out of control. So Paul's command removes any false feeling of security the sinning man might have among fellowshipping Christians. And just say, you need, you need to face it. See, we have a grace crazy Grace crazy church gone wild. We just, it's like nothing matters what you do. Let me, everything matters what you do. By, by grace are you saved through faith. If you believe on the Lord Jesus, that's the verb to the word faith. Faith in its original Greek means trust and obey. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's a, that's a sailor term, keeping the stars. They talked about a sailor would follow the stars to keep direction. And what Jesus is saying here when he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You will follow the word. You will follow me, my way, not your way. The, ten, the, the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not my will, God's will. So that's the heart of a true believer. I know that we're saved by grace by faith through grace. I know that it's not something you can do yourself, but grace isn't just some definition word that, that allows universal salvation just to believe about Jesus and what happened in the story and suddenly everybody's on their way to heaven. In a lot of places, that's the way they do it. And I'm telling you, that's not what the Bible teaches. Read it clear. Just read just the words of Jesus and you'll see. So he says to turn them over for the destruction of the flesh in that, those verses. What's he talking about? The sinful lust. Some people call the, the flesh 
when he talks in, in Galatians, it talks about there's a war between spirit and flesh. It talks about lust, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust, the lust of the eyes, the desires that are sinful within humanity because everybody is born the sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And only Jesus can change our heart. That's what grace does. It's a power to give us a new desire. And it's a power of the Spirit and the Word together to help us grow and become more like Him and be in the process of being sanctified, to be holy, be a godly people. This man, though a professing Christian, was at this time given over to the sins of the flesh. And Paul is saying, perhaps removing the man from fellowship would cause him to, to, to wake up. And perhaps the sexual impulse of the flesh would be destroyed. Here's a challenge. As Christians, we need to put the old man to death by crucifying the flesh daily. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. Don't live for yourself. Paul hopes that putting this man out of fellowship with the Corinthian church would lead him to crucify his flesh and the passions and desires. And then it says, the purpose is spirit. The verse says, may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. See, the goal is clear. The salvation of the man. Not the destruction of his spirit, but the salvation. Paul does not write him off as forever lost. So if you're here and you've had sin, sexual sins, do not hear the condemning voice of the devil that says you're done. Okay? No. Paul is saying, put him in a place where he'll turn and so he can see salvation. So effective church discipline or dealing with sin will cause a person to be saved, to become come back to God, to live for God, and listen to me. It's not for you to exact that discipline. It's, it's for me or one of the pastors. It's for leadership. Because if every one of you decides you're going to confront every person about everything, we're going to have a mess. Because that does get into judgment. That's not what it's saying here. Everybody with me? All right. Yeah. All right. Pray for people. So, uh, and and the attitude of, of our confrontation of sin needs to be restoration, not condemnation. Paul also wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, which means letter, note that the person, that person, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So there's a point by which you can be involved in sin. You're still a brother. Only God knows that. Treat him like a brother. Love him. Help him. Restore him. It's not, uh, who was it? Wearsby said this, church discipline, and I quote, church discipline is not a group of pious policemen out to catch a criminal. Rather, it's a group of brokenhearted brothers and sisters seeking to restore an erring member of the family. Paul does not say the church should take away the sinning man's salvation because the church can't grant salvation. It certainly can't take it away. But there's cases where it's good for the sinner and it's good for the church when someone has to be set aside and confronted if they don't repent. This public display of incest was horrible and the Corinthians wouldn't do anything about it and they were bragging about how open-minded that they were. So it's true. People back away from this subject because some churches have been cruel toward their members and unjustly kicked some people out of the congregation. But it doesn't mean that the Bible's teaching shouldn't be practiced in some cases. And secondly, they had one church in Corinth. Here, a person just leaves that church, goes to the next church, and they talk about how they were mistreated at the other church. So they're not going to be under discipline. So nothing ever happens. Uh, and they just badmouth the old church. We got to deal with sin in the church sometimes, and it's not easy. That it needs to be done right, rightfully so, and and I've had to do that some. And it's not easy, and uh, I've had to deal with sin in my life. How about you? Holy Spirit, help us. Then first, first Corinthians, the second point. Not only uh, we need to deal with with uh, the sin in the church, because. God cares about the purity of the church. It's important, the importance of the purity of the church. Verse 6 of our chapter 5, a little sin influences the entire group is what it's saying. You're glorying, they're, they're glorying how loving and accepting they are. It's not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So uh, they were proud and pleased again to be ignoring this man's notorious sin. They thought it showed the whole world how loving they were and open-minded and, uh, but you, if you, you can love your body to a point of being kind to a cancer, and that's not good. We are a body. And it, the point is, leaven spreads. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's why the impurity in the church is important, because we affect each other. 
Think of the power that would be here if we all lived in purity before God. You see, leaven mentioned isn't merely yeast here. Listen, it's like, how many of you have ever done, passed on sourdough, you know, a little sourdough patch, you know, then you make your own and pass it on to sourdough stuff. Well, see, that's kind of the way it was. A pinch of the dough left over from the previous batch that had been risen, a, a little bit of that added to a new uh, a lump of dough, then would cause it to rise to, in other words, leaven, uh, is very powerful and it spreads and it rises up dough rises and it's puffed up so the work of leaven is thought to be an illustration of the work of sin and of pride the presence of a little leaven a little can corrupt a large amount so thus this one believer that wasn't dealt with going on just letting it go is setting an example and others would follow in that and be led by it in the light in this light the passover command to purge the leaven was a lesson that sin has a tendency to grow and spread. That's why they clean the leaven out, it's serious. Unleavened bread and unleavened, uh, 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 is very important, unleavened lives, sinless lives. So then in, Second Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, 8, we read this, with the encouragement that we live a, a perpetual Passover feast life. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. When the death angel was coming over, the Israelites were protected by putting the blood of the lamb over the door. And Christ is represented by that lamb. And we're protected by the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, by grace through faith, that God, we can trust him. And therefore, because of such great sacrifice, we give our lives and we lay our lives down so that no leaven would affect us, that sin would be out of our our lives and as a, as a fellowship that we do our best to walk in purity before God that's what this is saying for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the leaven of the bread of sincerity and truth sincere truth boy does religion need that I mean sincerity and truth Purge out the old leaven. At the Passover feast, all the leaven was to be removed from the house and nothing with leaven in it was to be eaten for a whole week. Paul says that just as the Jews were concerned to remove all the leaven from their midst, so the church should have a concern to remove all such notorious, unrepentant sinners in the midst because it's a spreading. That's the importance of the purity of the church. Christ is our Passover. And Jesus is in fact our Passover lamb whose blood was shed that the judgment of God might pass over us so we are to live in purity, in purity that Passover represents. Here's what Passover represents. It marks the same things that we need to be as believers and that salvation, liberation. Remember the Israelites, liberated, joy, plenty, purity, freedom from sin. Spurgeon said it this way, uh, since you're truly leavened, Spurgeon said, salvation in sin is not possible. It must always be salvation from sin. And it's a process of God continuing to get us out of sin, to be overcomers in Christ. So dealing with sin in the church is important. There's the importance of the purity of the church and uh, sincerity and truth. Boy, these are guardrails that we need as a church because I'm telling you, so many people have been turned away because leadership are just not sincere. They have wrong motives, impure motives, impure lives, impure thoughts. The truth is not spoken. People grow. There's no power in something that's not any truth. So why do I need it? I look just like everybody else. There's nothing that's going to change me. Listen, we need truth. We need sincerity. That's what he says we should have. And the third thing is the principle of Christian separation. I'm about done. Verse 9, Paul, Paul says, says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. I wrote to you in my epistle. It would have been a previous letter from Paul that didn't make the canon. And like I said, uh, such letters were inspired to speak to that specific church at a specific time, but not to all the church for all time. So such letters were not preserved by the Holy Spirit throughout the church that are in the canon. Plus, it didn't add anything to what was already taught. Notice the words keep company, not to keep company with sexual immoral people in verse number nine. That means to mix it up together. It's not a casual type of deal. It's the context of social relationships, meaning to mingle with or associate with in a close way. Chapter 
5, 10 to 13, Paul clarifies. He says, I'm not talking about the sinners outside the church. I'm talking about the Christians inside the church. That's the people that you need to not associate with when they say they're this and they do that. Yet I certainly do not mean with sexually immoral people out of this world, of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I've written to you not to keep company closely is what he's referring to with anyone named a brother. Says there a brother or a sister who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. He says, yet I did not mean with sexually immoral people of the world. Paul didn't want the Corinthian Christians to expect godly behavior from ungodly people, did they? To disassociate from sinners in a sinful world would mean would, we'd, we'd have to go out of the world ourselves and we wouldn't have a witness to those people. So here, here's the thing. It shouldn't surprise or offend us when someone that doesn't know Jesus is covetous, like it says. That means who must have more, how to got to have more. Or extortioners in the Greek, which means describes those who steal by violence, like the Mexican drug cartel. It shouldn't surprise or offend us that those who do not know Jesus act as a reviler, and that's someone describing a person who assassinates character. But the Corinthian Christians were expected to have Christian behavior from among their fellow Christians, and they weren't doing this. Paul even commands they not even to eat with such a person. Why is he saying that? Because he's, he's talking about someone that you're very close. Eating had to do something in their culture that's very close. You're connected. You're, you're, you're like part of their life in a, in, a, in, a, in a close way. And this is a notorious against Christian. This isn't someone just because they're weak in the flesh. I mean, remember, this is an incestuous sin. So what have I had to do with judging those who are outside? Those who are outside, God judges. And like I said, we do the opposite. We'll judge the people in the world, but not ourselves. Therefore, put away. Don't judge those who are, you do, do, do you not judge though, those who are inside, he says. Therefore, put away from yourself the evil person. So they were failing to do that. Will you bow your head with me? The notorious sinner was in their midst. They should have done something that was loving and that was correct and confront. But instead, they were puffed up and proud how open-minded and loving they were and accepting of anyone and everyone, no matter where they're coming from. There are two reasons why this is important. To deal with sinning people in the church who are openly rebelling sinning it's the sake of the purity of the church because it's so important because we are one together but it's also that person's own salvation how how unmerciful to let it go unchallenged and let the person die without god